Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Fluctus Channel. Since the beginning of the space age in the 1950s, development has continued in the systems necessary to obtain more efficient and long-lasting space flights. An important part of this development has focused on propulsion systems, seeking to create more powerful rockets, adopt new materials, and optimize fuel consumption. With innovative solutions such as reusable rockets, the doors have been opened to manage new missions and improve the processes of existing ones. Humans taking aim on the international outpost. NASA's Artemis III mission to the Moon, Comet Interceptor mission from the European Space Agency, and SpaceX mission to Mars is just a brief overview of the upcoming space missions. Of the various companies providing new systems and devices to make these missions come to fruition, Mitsubishi's Nagoya Aerospace Systems can be considered one of the most important. Inside their Oye and Tobishima plants, the company designs and manufactures expendable launch systems, especially their H-2A, H-2B, and H-3 rockets. Both versions of the H-2 are high-performance rockets, consisting of a first stage, second stage, fairing, and one or two pairs of solid rocket boosters. This family of boosters has been an important piece of the Japanese space launch industry since 2001. Since 2001, this family of boosters has been an important piece of the Japanese space launch industry. The third type of rocket, the H-3, is a system under development to be Japan's new flagship rocket, meeting the global launch service demands for a wide range of payloads. Its manufacturing begins with selecting the best possible materials, including aluminum sheets, to manufacture the rocket body and other substructures. Aluminum is chosen because it's lightweight, technically advanced in forming and alloying, and relatively low cost, especially when compared to titanium and composites. This is why Mitsubishi uses sheets of this material, usually 5 eighths of an inch thick. Considering the enormous loads and vibrations that can be generated by a rocket, the plates alone cannot resist these conditions. Therefore, this situation is resolved by transforming this plate into an isogrid structure. This is achieved by machining the piece of the aluminum stock into a skin with stiffeners, which form equilateral triangles. Such a shape is very efficient because it retains rigidity and evenly distributes the loads throughout the structure, all while saving material and weight. CNC machines are ideal for milling the face of the aluminum plate and obtaining the geometries and dimensions required by the company. By having the panels machined, they are carried into rolling machines to form and obtain the cylindrical shapes necessary to build the fuel tank. Before this process, the isogrid panels are filled with a low melting wax. This allows the bending force to be distributed throughout the structure during rolling, making it stable and reducing the possibility of forming irregular skin and buckling of the ribs. For both versions of the H-2 rockets, 
the LE7A engine is used. A two-staged combustion engine using liquid hydrogen and oxygen. Its manufacturing requires specialized materials such as aluminum and titanium. To withstand the enormous temperatures, a nickel super alloy is used for the engine skirt. As an improvement on the previous LE7 engine, the aim was to reduce the use of welding, so almost all components are machined or cast. This meant reconfiguring the pipework around the motor, but resulted in a more efficient propulsion system. Once the engine has been manufactured, the company moves it into a test facility to perform an acceptance test. This test evaluates the correct assembly and performance of the engine, so it can be considered proper for mass production. Here, the rocket is placed horizontally and connected to a multitude of sensors to measure its combustion rate, temperature, and thrust. With all the rocket components prepared, they must be transported to the launch site. For this, the rocket is encapsulated with protective fairings or containers to shield it from the marine environment during transportation. This also includes the payload that will be launched by the rocket, usually important instrumentation for the International Space Station or satellites. The rocket stages are then loaded onto a cargo vessel to be sent to the nearest port, where the cargo is translated to heavy trucks that travel the remaining route to the launching site. Once there, the engineers start mounting vertically the stages from the engines up to the payload stage using crane systems. Considering its large size, the rocket is transported to the launch pad using a crawler transporter, a heavy-duty tracked vehicle that can carry enormous loads. Once there, the launching control systems are connected to the combustion systems, so the engineers can operate and monitor the rocket conditions before and during the ignition. Final inspections are made to every stage, including the top of the rocket where the satellites are located, ending with the countdown and launching it to outer orbit. Although rocket technology and launches are unprecedented engineering work, it's important to know that their main objective is to transport cargo be it crew or instruments, including iconic satellites. Such objects are placed into orbit for communication, scientific or military purposes. Their potential has driven several companies to develop and build more advanced and efficient satellites. This includes Airbus's space portfolio, which manufactures exceptionally reliable, high-performance telecommunication satellites. In this case, the company uses composite and aluminum alloys to build the satellite structural components.
High precision electronic components including antennas and transponders are used to ensure reliability in communicating operations. Their satellites use an array of solar panels and batteries to provide power for the satellite. Usually, solar panels use gallium arsenide based materials. These have a higher efficiency and degrade more slowly than silicon in the space radiation environment. Systems like the thrusters and thermal control systems are installed in the structure, followed by the wiring integration of all the components. Once the assembly is complete, the satellite is placed in an anechoic chamber for electromagnetic compatibility testing. This test ensures that the electronic systems of the satellite do not interfere with each other and that no external disturbance affects the performance of those devices. By certifying the performance of the satellite, Airbus can send it to the launching companies to get it into space. One of the companies with the capacity to put these satellites into orbit is United Launch Alliance. This American company was formed as a joint venture between Lockheed Martin Space and Boeing Defense Space and Security. It can design, assemble, and launch rockets, subcontracting the production of solid rocket boosters. Its 1.6 million square feet production facility in Decatur, Alabama can simultaneously produce components for multiple rockets. Inside, the company has several production stations, starting with booster production. Where skin milling machines create the aluminum grid plate stock that is brake form to be used to construct the fuel tank sections. Those aluminum parts are washed with a high pressure machine and then dipped into an electrolytic solution to anodize the part and create a protective coating against corrosion and wear. The curved panels are welded through vertical or circumvential friction stir welding with the advantage of not adding any filler material that might weaken the joint. Once the structure is assembled, they are primed and insulated from the vibrations and liftoff acoustics. This is followed by the production of the Centaur 5 upper stage. Done through the same steps as the fuel tanks, using only thin stainless steel instead of aluminum. It ends with the testing procedures including pressure and comprehensive testing to ensure it is ready for transport to the launch sites. This process is repeated for each mission and condition in which a rocket is to be launched, including their latest NROL-70 mission. Conducted for the National Reconnaissance Office, the mission's purpose is to enhance the U.S. national security apparatus by deploying advanced reconnaissance systems. Using the Delta IV heavy launch vehicle, ULA can send an overhead reconnaissance device to collect intelligence for national security and support disaster relief and humanitarian efforts. Both Japanese and American companies show different approaches when developing new technology for the aerospace industry. However, precision and attention to detail are something that both share. 
Also, the two have an innate desire to innovate and improve the current condition of space flights. This diversity of methodologies results in the overall progress in space technology. That's the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss any of our new content. See you next time.